to this edition of the Pipe Bomb Wrestling Podcast, a show that is for the fans, by the fans. I am your phenomenal host, Mr. Podcast, and Chris Belcher. You can follow me at Chris Belcher 24 on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Shows at PBW Podcast. Make sure you give us a follow uh, on, again, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. And, of course, Bodyslam.net YouTube channel. I am, of course, here in the same room. What is this, three weeks in a row? Three weeks in a row. Man, we are making it happen. Andy York (laughs) in the house, man. How's it going? Uh, It's good. I am uh, very excited to talk about a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that happened this week in wrestling. Uh, A lot of good, a lot of bad. So (laughs) it's going to be fun to kind of dive into it and talk about it. A lot of good, bad, indifferent. I wouldn't say ugly, but indifferent. Indifferent, yes. Definitely indifferent. For sure. We're going to get it. Controversial is, is a good way to put it. That's it for sure. Um, thank you for joining us on a Friday, or if you're listening later on, thank you for doing that. Make sure you tune into our Tuesday show, PBWF, our fantasy booking show that is headed to pay per view number four, yep. headed down the stretch. So, hope you guys are digging that. I know we are digging it. Uh, so make sure you check that out and you can get that audio only. So, that's wherever you find your podcast. All right, man, let's get into it. First thing I want to talk about, and this is kind of last week's news, but we had Crown Jewel preview and we had a lot of stuff going on last week, so we didn't really get to it. But I want to bring it up now is Nick Aldis. Mm-hmm. Nick did an interview on Sam Roberts' podcast that actually dropped um, yesterday. Yesterday, maybe. I think so. Um, that I haven't got to listen to yet. I don't know if you have or not, but I haven't got to listen to it yet, but I really want to because. Yeah. I think it's going to be really good because I think Aldis is going, I know Matt Cardona and I really like him talking about being the free agent and all that, man, Nick Aldis is going to make some waves in 2023. I honestly, I think the perfect fit for Nick Aldis is in WWE. Yep. I think Nick Aldis, could you imagine, let's just, we're going to fantasy book for a second. Could you imagine the rumble? Yep. Cody Rhodes is in the ring. Yep. Nick Aldis comes out, yep. and we have that whole history of him, the NWA. Michael Cole's going crazy on commentary talking about the NWA because we're talking about other promotions now. Yep. Bullet Club got name dropped on SmackDown, which was wild, crazy. Yep. Um, so yeah, I think I think WWE is a great spot for Nick Aldis. I feel like, especially with Triple H in charge, Nick Aldis is a Triple H kind of guy. Absolutely, like he a is. Triple H kind of guy because he's he's an old school guy that fits in today's world Yep, and that shouldn't really work yep. in it. So I think, I think Nick Aldis would work really, really well on that. Um, man, the NWA is, is falling apart very quickly. I don't know, man. <laughs> it's I, falling apart. It, I guess what happened, that's what happens when you have a rock star running the company. Now. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. And, um, I mean, they, they were doing such good stuff in 2019 with um, power yep. on, I think it started on YouTube. They were doing power and all this mm-hmm. other stuff. And like, for the first time in a long time, NWA on like nationally was being picked up again, which was a big deal. Mm-hmm. We went to the the seventieth anniversary seventieth anniversary show in, in Nashville. Yep, uh, which Nick Aldis and Cody Rhodes two out of three falls. Yep, and they like fought all over the the fairgrounds. That that was a lot of fun. Yep, um, I forget what else kind of happened on that show. That was a uh, what was it willie mack that won the national title on that show i think that was the debut of the of the national they were yeah they were bringing it back that night we saw sammy guevara that night yeah he was in the trip the fatal four way -way. kenny king i think was there too was it no it wasn't sammy it was um was it sammy i look really quick i think i'm pretty sure it was sammy um anyway uh dexter loomis was in it yeah to see him um so they were like but they were doing really like they were Penelope Ford wrestled. They they were at the top. They were getting there. They were like they were back to being a company wrestling fans were talking about. Sure. And then it has it, it's just it's amazing the, how quickly they fall. Well, and then the pandemic happens, and right. obviously every wrestling company suffered in the pandemic. And then we start to get crowds back, and Cardona shows up in NWA yeah. and wins the title, and then that whole thing that got people talking starts you know talking, and then Cardona gets hurt, and yeah. then now it's. Who knows, man? It's falling apart. (laughs) Who knows, man? But Nick Aldis, man, I really think he's going to be highly coveted by both WWE and AEW. And Impact, I think, too. And Impact, most likely. Because he was there. Yeah, and you got to also know, like, his wife is heavily involved. Mickey James is heavily involved in Impact Wrestling, too. So, honestly, I think he ends up in WWE or Impact before he ends up in AEW. I agree with that. Because I don't think... I don't think he fits the AEW mold. I don't think they'll know what to do with him. Right. 
Um, and so I, I feel like he would be a better, I mean, if, if NXT is kind of heading back to what it was, Nick Olson NXT 10 years, five years ago would have been yep. what Bobby Roode should have been sure. in NXT. I feel like, sure. so I feel like he's going to come in. If he goes to WWE, he's going to come in and be a big time name. And I'm not, I'm not knocking AEW. We know if you listen to this podcast anytime, I'm more positive about AEW than anybody on the show. Sure. I just, I, I, I just feel like. Nick Aldis fits the WWE mold better than he fits AEW. Yep. Yeah, absolutely he does. And I think WWE can make him a big time star. And I think, you know, NXT would be still be a good place for him even now, I think, you know, yeah. it, where they're slowly sort of trying to get this combination of 2.0 and black and gold. Yep. I think he would be a great fit there. And obviously impact, he would be, a t he would get in there and be the top guy really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting. I, but I do think, man, if there was ever a time to go to WWE for it's Nick now. Aldis, it's right now. Yep. Um, so contract is up in January. And he sh him showing up in the Rumble would be the wildest thing. Yep. And we're off to the races. Yeah. And I mean, you know, uh, Nick Aldis versus Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania, I, I would be fine with. Sure. If, if we're not going, let's say Rock is there. And the plan is Rock Roman. I feel like we always. I think I feel like somehow every week we fit in Rock Roman <laughs> one way or another. It is literally the biggest storyline that doesn't exist. It is, but it does exist. But it does right. If if Rock Roman is going to happen, I think the next best thing for Cody is Nick Aldis at WrestleMania. Sure. For the IC title, that would be That'd be wild. That would be amazing, bro. Could you imagine if Nick Aldis did with the Intercontinental title what he's done with the NWA? Oh title my gosh! And he, like open challenge stuff and all that. Man, I feel like. Wow. We're on a real rabbit hole now, yes, but we are. I feel like Walter has been the done that with the title, like a, a Gunther Nick Aldis match would be wild, perfect. Yep. And I feel like honestly, it would be like taking the title off somebody and giving it to a twin. Like it would like they 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 fit like they feel like the same kind of person in a, in a lot of ways. So yep. I think you could do that with that. I see. I think you could do that with the U.S. title. Um, because obviously with Triple H in charge, they have been they've done a fantastic job of making both mid card titles feel extremely important because the world title is not always there. So they they've done a great job of that. And if you bring somebody like Nick Aldis in and build him up properly, yep. then then you're off and running. You can also have him win the U.S. title and refuse to call it the U.S. title because he's not from exactly. America. That exactly. would be hilarious. Uh, exactly. So good things. I really think that, you know, the time is now for Nick Aldis to be in WWE. But if he doesn't, uh, no knock against He's going to be anybody. successful no matter where he goes. Yeah, he he's just one of those guys. He really is. Yeah. All right, let's talk about AEW. Speaking of, we'll let give you a chance to be positive here. Yay. Uh, we'll talk about AEW. Listen, you're normally the positive one. Let me be the positive one to start with, okay? Yeah. I'll be honest. I hardly ever watch any undercard uh -huh. of AEW. Mm -hmm. You know that. Everybody that listens to this podcast knows that. I just don't. If it doesn't have anything to do with Jericho, Brian, Adam Cole, Sting. Kenny Omega, Sting, if it doesn't have anything to do with those guys, I'm probably not paying attention. Right. I'll watch it, Right. but I'm not invested. Bro, Dynamite kicked off with the guns coming out in their Shawn Michaels tribute gear. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> lost it. That was awesome. Yes, it was. Because I was like, wait a minute. Wait, that's, yep. that's so good. Have they ever done that before? Is that new? Is um, that just like a one-off maybe? I think it was a one. Well, where was Dynamite last night? Boston. Or Friday night. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they've done that before or if that was just kind of a, a one off thing, but it was super it was cool. great. It, it was, was great. super cool. I was so excited about that. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the big probably the biggest piece of news coming out of Dynamite, and that is Soraya, formerly known as Paige, has officially been cleared for entering competition. Yep. And we're probably gonna see her and Britt Baker one on one at full gear. Yep. Um man, not just for the fact for AEW, but She's cleared. Yep. Like this is humongous. The reaction that she got when she announced it was amazing. Yeah, I one this might this is probably the biggest field that a women's match in AEW has had, maybe ever. Probably ever. Yeah. I mean, Britt and to and uh, Thunder Rosa felt felt pretty big. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I don't really know of anything before that that felt huge. She was like this. Like, this feels no, like this. Really? I'm honestly, this is the equivalent of like 
I'm going to get a lot of hate for this probably, but it's the oh. equivalent of like a Trish and Lita facing uh, uh, Charlotte or a Becky or whatever, because it's like somebody that paved the way for all of this to happen sure. versus the person that has now picked up that mantle and has carried it. Sure. Very. I mean, there's no, de- there's no denying that the best thing in the women's division consistently from the beginning of AEW has been Britt Baker. And she said it in a promo. She yeah. was right. And she, she has been the most consistent. She's been the best. When she is involved, it automatically makes it feel bigger. Sure. You add Soraya to the mix, or Soraya, or have you? Soraya? 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 I think. There you go. I think. Yeah. If you add Soraya to the mix, and it just it adds to it even more. So I, th- I'm i very excited for whenever this match happens. Like, more than likely, it's going to happen at full gear. Um, I hope Paige, I hope she stays safe. I hope Soraya, Sor- Soraya, Soraya? Yep. Okay. I hope Soraya. St- I hope she stays safe because she's come back before and just freak things have happened. Right. So I hope she's. I hope she stays safe and healthy because women's wrestling is better when she's involved in it. Sure it is. And so that's great. Her promos have been getting better and better. She's getting more. She's getting back to who she was. She's getting sure. more comfortable in the ring. Um. And so I'm. I'm very excited to see that match whenever they finally go at it. And speaking of disasters happening, how cool was it? Uh, I'm sure that, I don't know if she said it or if it's just floating around online or whatever, that the first person she texted when she got cleared was Sasha Banks. Really? To tell her, don't worry anymore. Uh-huh. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm sure, I'm, I mean, you, you've got to put yourself in a Seth Rollins and a Sasha Banks state of mind when something like that happens to a legend. Yep. I mean, when Seth, when Seth, Buckle bomb sting. Buckle bomb sting. I'm not saying he injured sting because that right. that was not Seth's fault. Right. Right. Um, you could just tell that Seth was yep. worried about it. There have been interviews afterwards, and I, I I don't think I think Sting and Seth have talked since then. Sure, they have. And they're like, Sting was like, it's it happens. Like, well, yeah, you think about this, and we're going to kind of go down a rabbit hole here, even though we're talking about AEW, we're going to talk about WWE for a minute. Seth Rollins and Sasha Banks are two of the most polarizing figures online yes. in terms of how fans feel about them. Yes. You either absolutely love them or you, or them. you absolutely hate them. Yep. Both have been known to have bad interactions with fans. Yep. Both have been known to be stuck up. Both have been known to be rude. Both, whether they've tweeted something out or the interaction or whatever. Yep. But no matter who you are, like you have to realize the weight of what they've been carrying around with these two injuries. Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. So whether you like them or you don't like them, like you have to feel, you have to feel good for them, feel good for Seth that Sting's been doing his thing and he's yep. fine, and feel good for Sasha now that Soraya is is back. And both of the injuries were freak injuries. Yeah, I. You know. I, I completely agree because I, I feel like Seth and Sasha are are cut from the same cloth of like they're very opinionated. Yep. They're gonna let their opinions be shared, but they back up everything they say at the same time. Absolutely. Like there's no denying that Sasha is probably in ring the best women's wrestler today. Maybe of all time. In ring. She pushes all time for sure. She she's up there. No Seth, doubt. Seth Rollins is one of the best generational talent of all time yep um do i agree with everything they have said absolutely not i don't agree with everything that they have said right but i understand like this is a thing like this is a uh, industry that they make look so easy when in reality it is very very difficult and if you do one thing wrong yep you have a big e moment yep. where rich holland drops him on his neck and breaks his neck yep. um which you know, Rich Holland has to carry that around with him now. Like Big E may never wrestle again, and that's that's technically Rich Holland's fault, even though it's it is, but it isn't. Yep. Um, and Seth, man, Seth went through that rough spell when he did that to Sting, and then a couple weeks later broke Cena's nose, and everybody was calling him an unsafe worker, mm-hmm. and everybody's like, "It's not unsafe. It's just <laughs> that's just that that's yeah, how it happens." Bret Hart still calls Seth out. For all that, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, Bret Hart's just a grumpy, bitter old man because Goldberg broke his neck. So, like, I, I just... Very true. Bret Hart is one of those guys... I mean, speaking of Bret Hart, have you heard what Road Dogg has said about Bret Hart? Oh, no. Uh-uh. Uh, that he was not... that He was a great sports entertainer, but when it came to in-ring work, Road Dogg was better than Bret Hart, basically. Uh, <laughs> I was like, that's a stretch. Um, it might be a stretch. I'll give... Uh, that's a debate for another time. But, yeah. Uh, but I, you know, okay. it, it could very easily though. You could easily have a legend. 
I mean, it could have been very easy for Sting to go the Bret Hart route with sure. Seth or for Soraya to go the same route with Sasha. Sure. Um, but everybody and you, understands. And you couldn't, you couldn't blame either of them no, if that happened. No. Because to an extent, we give Bret Hart a hard time for being grumpy and all that. But, like, to a to a point, can you blame them? Right. You know, you change that person's life forever. And I, and with the Bret Hart thing with Goldberg, it's completely, it's kind of different because he was like, don't do this. Sure. And, <laughs> and Goldberg, did, Goldberg it anyway. did it anyway. It's yeah. like that, that, that's completely different than just a freak thing in the middle of the ring right. that nobody could have could have stopped and we also just like to dump on bret hart because, and goldberg because it's fun. <laughs> yeah and goldberg it's fun all right one of the other big things that happened on dynamite man was the turn of samoa joe finally turning on ward low you're welcome um yes there you go <laughs> listen to pbwf this has already happened um put him in a steel cage it works it works <laughs> try man really really cool I was I was hesitant of this duo to begin with because yeah. I'm like they're way better opponents than they are yeah. you know whatever and then finally we get the split, but that's not really what I want to gripe on with this. Oh, can I gripe? Because I think I know what your gripe is, Go ahead. and it ticked me off too. This was a Edge appearing back at the Royal Rumble in yep. 2020, going for the spear, and we missed the spear because you cut from the spear to go to the stupid fan. Nobody cares about the fan. Yeah, we cut from Samoa Joe getting like we see him. Hold Load, the title. Loading up. And then when he goes, we just cut. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why are we cutting the attack? Yep. Production, that pr- that production stuff, that annoys me. Yep. I don't care about some camera angles stuff that we miss. Like, I, it doesn't take me out of it. But that was like, dude, that was the one thing that you had to shoot. You knew it was coming. Yeah, you had to shoot that and you missed it. You knew it was coming. That is like WWE missing Edge of Spear. Yes. But like, in a way... But, like, the first thing that popped in my head when I'm watching this was, like, man, this would be, like, and I know the weight is a little bit different, but, again, first example I could think of was that would be, like, if WWE missed Rollins' chair shot. If they just got him loading up to hit and then we cut back to Triple H. Exactly. Like, what, what, what are we doing? Yeah. Like, we can't tell what Hobbs is saying when he comes down the ramp. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Whatever. We know he's coming. And we miss Samoa Joe hitting Wardlow. Yeah. And I'm sorry, they're going back and showing the replay does not help. No. You missed it. Yeah. And then they put, <laughs> they posted it on social media. They posted that clip of them cutting from from the title shot, like him hitting them with, mm-hmm. the, with the belt to Hobbs. Everybody's like, why are we not showing the other one where we actually get to see what happened? I don't understand. Like, that is the perfect example of why I hate AEW production. Yeah. Right there. Like, you've been in this business now for three years, and you – you some the problem is that somebody chose to cut right there. Yeah, it's not like it was a slip of a finger. It's not like it was whatever. Yeah, somebody said somebody said switch right right, right exactly. There. I so AW, frustrated. AEW production I feel like has gotten better. It has because I agree. like the C, when CM Punk returned at uh, Rampage, how they cut how they did the camera cut and stuff like that for him and all the different camera angles. Sure, perfect. I yeah. love that. There are some things that I can forgive you for missing. Like, if you miss a move here and there in a match because, you know, there are 15 people in the match and there's stuff going on everywhere, you're not going to you're not gonna capture everything. That's one thing. Right. But two dudes in the middle of the ring that they have been building this since last week. Because you could see – last week you saw Joe when Wardlow shoved him. You could see Joe was like, don't don't touch me. Like, right. you could see this building, and then you just miss it. That that was so frustrating. Like, you know it's coming. Like, I understand that AEW does more things off the cuff than WWE does. Right. I get that. But if you know that the reason, the whole reason this angle is happening in the ring is it's because this moment. It's because this moment. Yeah. And you choose to, that's, that's just dumb. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. Thank you for uh, taking the words out of my mouth. Speaking of bad production. I'm just going to say this. This is nitpicky on me because I feel weird saying this because I work in television now. I can say this. Brag. I'm just playing. <laughs> this is why I'm complaining I'm about just... this. So when they showed the backstage yeah. with the uh, with Orange Cassidy and Dan Housen and the best friends, yeah. and um, I keep thinking of TSF because of the factory. Factory guys. <laughs> QT Marshall, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all those yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, when they showed all that, they showed this little beef with 
Dan Housen and all those guys. And then they did a white flash. And then they showed the best friends coming back in, challenging Jay Lethal yeah. to a match. And what was the next thing they showed? The Jay Lethal, Chucky, wh whoever was in the match. Trent Beretta. Trent Beretta. Okay. Yeah. The very next thing the they graphic. showed. Jay Lethal was in a suit. Yeah. Ten seconds later, yeah. Jay Lethal's in his tights in the ring. Now, I, I have noticed sometimes, though, they do this and they say earlier today. That would have been fine. Was it in? Was that not in? No, I, I missed that segment. It was not in okay. there. That makes yeah. That that part frustrates. If if you do the earlier today and you show it, that makes sense. Now it makes sense to have a graphic. Excalibur tried to cover it up afterwards, and saying, "Okay, we saw from earlier today. Whatever, that needs to be on the front yeah, end, yeah, 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 not yeah, the back yeah, end, because yeah. that leaves me as the viewer incredibly confused as yeah. to what is going but, on." But I mean, credit to Excalibur for being like, "Oh, let's pick the like." Easy fix, really quick. Like, sure. I feel like in the early stages of AEW, Excalibur got a lot of right flag. Uh -huh. Excalibur is the best announcer in AEW. AEW would fail from a presentation standpoint if Excalibur, without Excalibur. Because I, I'm just going to tell you now, nobody reads a card better than Excalibur. I wish they would find a better place to place it, but yes, I agree. like. I it's just the thing. It's just a staple now of like let's throw all these matches together and let's make X, let's make Excalibur read every single one of them without taking a breath, and he doesn't miss like no, ever. Um, I will say the fact that Taz has become a full time commentator yep. has made commentary so a better. lot better. So much better when Regal is on commentary with all of them. Like if we need to do a three man booth in AEW. I'm fine if it's Taz, Regal, and Excalibur. Right. Because I've, one, I love the fact that Regal just love it, loves Excalibur as much as he does. Right. But two, like, they just, they fit, they fit well together. They flow well together. Excalibur and Taz have this weird chemistry that mm -hmm. works extremely well. Yep. So, like, I feel like we have, now that JR is not on as much and Shivani is not on as much, I feel like commentary has gotten much, much better. Yep. I agree. Much better. Yeah. I totally agree. For sure. All right. Uh, that, those are my gripes from <laughs> AEW. The other thing that we need to talk about from AEW, man, Jeff Jarrett, who, if you listen to PBWF, is a rock star. He is. Um, and apparently he's a rock star on AEW, too. Second week yeah. on AEW, already taking shots at WWE. Yeah. It was hilarious. Yeah, it's easy. It's, it's really it's, funny. It's, it's, it's the thing you do in AEW is when you're a former WWE guy, first thing you do is take a shot. Which he did. That's fine. The Braun Strowman thing was hilarious. It was very funny. He didn't have to call out Triple H in the Banana Nose Circus, but whatever. I feel like there's always been a lot of beef between Triple H and Jeff Jarrett. Well, that's probably why he got fired. Was yeah. Because Triple Vince, if you listen to Jeff Jarrett's podcast, yeah. Jeff was the last hire that Vince made. Yeah. Before Vince stepped away. Yeah. Bringing him back. And one of the first people that was let go was, was Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. After yeah. they finished the storyline at SummerSlam, he was gone very <laughs> shortly after that. Yeah. And I'm sure part of that is because Jeff Jarrett and Triple H don't think the same way with how things should be run. Sure. I think I think Jeff Jarrett falls in line with the Vince yes, he does. mentality more than I agree. Triple H. Well, yeah, that's because he he grew up in the business. Yeah. Just like Vince grew up in the business, you know, so that kind of thing. Um, main event. Brian and Sammy was really good. Yeah. I just didn't think it needed two out of three falls. I don't think that helped it. I, I don't think it helped it. I don't think it hurt it, though, either. No. I think it made it more interesting because you got to see Brian, I mean, get the crap absolutely beat out of him That's for true. a majority of it, and then he made the comeback, Um, which him being busted open and bleeding from his eye, that was rough. It was. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I think you could put any – if you – Next time, if you want to do any stipulation with this, the first ever like Iron Man match in WWE in AEW, Sammy Guevara and Brian Danielson would be great. Yep. <clears throat> I will say this though, we need to start seeing less and less of Sammy because Sammy is is I understand heel heat and there's a difference in heel heat and being ridiculous. Yep. And the fact that he has not been punished for everything that happened with Eddie Kingston and all this other stuff. Well, yeah, Tony, but Tony. Tony is starting to show his favorites. Well, that he's he's shown his favorites for a long time. If right. you look at Miro's social media and you know his wife and everything, you'll see that. Yeah, they talk about and that. She, um, and to be fair, she even said like Vince had his favorites. Sure, Triple H oh, no. has his. Like everybody has their favorites. Everybody has their push. favorites. No, I think my point is is that 
we don't know that Sammy wasn't punished. I mean, he could right. have been. He could have been. We don't know. We just we just know what we see when they come through the garden. Right. And like I would I would I would tend to lean the way you're thinking as well. But this and the Andrade thing happened after the all out circus that took sure. place. So That's like true. this was a chance for Tony to be like, boom, we're like foot down, we're not doing this crap anymore. And Andrade got sent home and Sammy Guevara won the main event that night. So like It's true. There 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 are a lot of things that, that <laughs> should that's true should be looked at when it comes to to personalities and actions and things like that that's very true that's very true but you know and it i don't know i am on the other side of i very much enjoy when sammy Guevara is on tv i, I enjoy when he wrestles i understand that he has heel heat and go away heat and all this other stuff yep. but I also loves that he pl- i love that he plays into it oh yeah and oh yeah i think it's fine but that's just me um all right, I think that's going to about do it for AEW. Um, if you're just now checking us out, welcome to the Fight Bomb Wrestling Podcast. It's a show that is for the fans, by the fans. We're just a couple of fans talking about wrestling, um, even though we try to book it. If you want to listen to that craziness, <laughs> make sure you do that on Tuesdays. PBWF drops wherever you find your podcast, and if our video feed just cut out, stay tuned. We'll be right back because here we are. All right, <laughs> I'm a good spot for a commercial. There you go. There you go. Anyway, um, but thanks for hanging out with us. If you're listening on the Body Slam.net YouTube channel or watching our smiling faces, or you're listening on Sports Wire Radio or just wherever you find your podcast, hit that subscribe button, give us a review. Um, and I know that we would appreciate it and our partners would appreciate it as well. My name is Chris Belcher. This is Andy York. And we're going to talk about WWE, even though we've talked about WWE a little bit already. Let's just address the elephant in the room, man. Let's get it out of the way. Um, I know we're going to talk about Crown Jewel. We're going to talk about everything that happened, but. The big news in WWE this week is Austin Theory. Yeah. And his failed cash in on Monday night. For those of you who have not seen it, it's a situation where <laughs> Seth Rollins had an open challenge. Yeah. Bobby Lashley answered it. And Bobby Lashley annihilated Seth Rollins to the point where there was no match. Austin Theory came out, decided he was going to cash in for the United States title. Had a pretty solid match with Seth Rollins and proceeded to lose. <laughs> Seth Rollins wins. Yeah. Austin Theory does not have the money in the bank briefcase anymore. Yeah. Now, if you have listened to this podcast for any length of time, <laughs> mainly since July, yeah, when this whole debacle started, like you said earlier, I don't think we've come, we've had a podcast not talking about Rock and Roman. I don't <laughs> think we've had a podcast where we've talked about. Not talked about theory and his money in the bank situation. Who's he cashing in? Yeah. Who's he cashing in? When? Why is it wrong? Blah blah blah. Yeah. I don't think this was on the bingo card of what was going to happen. No, no, I did not expect the U.S. Championship cash in at all. I understand it. I did too. To an extent. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, you've got thoughts. Sure. I do have thoughts. I. I think this is easily one of the worst cash-ins of all time. Mm, could be. Because when you think of a good cash-in, right, you think of Seth Rollins' WrestleMania, you think of the first one with Edge, you think of Dolph Ziggler the night after WrestleMania. Then you've got some that are like... Typical. Typical or whatever, like Dean Ambrose cashing in on Seth Rollins the same night. and Alexa Bliss. Alexa Bliss. Kane cashing in on Rey Mysterio the same night. Like, yep. things like that. This one... I feel like they had been building this up for so long. Yep. And then it just, this. It, it died. <laughs> it died very quick. And I understand change of power. People have different philosophies. I'm sure if Triple H was in charge during Money in the Bank, Austin Theory would not have won yep. the briefcase. I just, I don't know. I feel, I feel like you could have done this and have Roman just beat him. Yep. Just beat him. Just annihilate him. Yeah, like... After the uh, Clash of the Castle, after his match with Logan Paul at Crown Jewel, you have Austin Theory come out, bell rings, he runs towards Roman, spear, one, two, three, Austin Theory is done. Because if you want to tell this story about Austin Theory just being dumped on over and over and over again, which it feels like that is the direction of the story right now, is, yep. is 
he is he it feels like he's being buried and if, if i think that's on purpose it is a thousand percent it is but there is a way to make him feel buried and not actually bury him at the same time and well, I, I feel like we're not burying him but it's just it, logically it makes no sense because if there's an open challenge and bobby lashley came out and destroyed him technically the open challenge is still there and i feel like we are at the point with seth rollins where he is basically almost a baby face yep for sure he could have just accepted the challenge and we go from there but just to cash in and then to lose, like I understand last year attacked him and everything else, but like it just it it did not. It felt like such a waste of the money in the bank. Well, let me say this: you're putting logic on an illogical situation. That's very true. You can't just say, "Well, it's an open challenge." That, that's you can't do that. So you got to suspend that one. Um, I get, I get it. Yeah. It makes sense to everybody, but it's wrestling. Um. I also am fine with the Roman idea. I would have been fine with Roman squashing him, whatever. What a lot of people are forgetting, because let's just be honest, almost everybody online is just taking Triple H to task for this. Mm -hmm. We got to remember two things. Number one, he lost to Seth Rollins. Mm -hmm. Seth Rollins is the dude, aside from Roman Reigns. Yeah. So it's not like he went in and cashed in on whoever the North American champion is right now. I don't know who it is. Carmelo Hayes still? I no, it's uh, 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 Wesley Blake. Okay. Is he the one that got released? He's not the one that got released. Murphy's the one that got released. So Wesley Blake. Okay. He's so, North okay. It's not like he went in and cashed in on Wesley Blake and Wesley Blake beat him. Right. Then, then we can have this discussion. But he lost to Seth Rollins still. Yeah. So I think you have to give some credit to that. That Seth Rollins is the top guy. So there's credibility. I think the second thing you got to remember, and everybody, again, we are in a territory in the WWE that we have never been in before. Yep. That is long-term storytelling. Yep. We were in that in the 80s, in the early 90s, because everything was taped. There was no live TV. So you could get away with that. Right. But because of live TV, we shifted our mindset. Well, now... We are in a long-term storytelling situation. I don't think we can say this. Is, I think standalone event, you can say this is one of the worst cash-ins of all time. But six to eight months down the road, we probably won't be saying that. Because I don't know what it's going to lead to. Mm-hmm. But I think theory is going to be better for it. I think there's a purpose to this. Because look, he could have gone in there and squat, got squashed by Roman. There was a there's a situation floating around online where it was discussed that Theory would cash in for one of the titles in the Drew McIntyre match. Right. And then make it a triple threat. And Drew would win that one title by pinning Theory. Right. And Roman keeps the other title and Theory's lost his briefcase. Okay. That would that's convoluted, but it kind of makes sense. There may have been a better way to go about this, but the reality is. Theory's going to be better for it. Just don't know how. Probably. I agree. We just have to wait and see. I agree. However, prime example, Daniel Bryan, WrestleMania 29. Was it the one in Florida? Miami was 28. 28. 31 seconds. Yep. Got beat by Sheamus. Yep. That led to the yes movement that led to all that. It's like long run, even though that wasn't the way that went, it worked out. But still, as the segment, as the match itself, yep. doesn't make a lot of stupid. sense. Stupid. <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense. It's very you're stupid. Right. So I feel like as an isolated segment, you're right. This, As a cash-in, this is one of the worst cash-ins of all time. Yeah, it didn't work. Storyline, it may work out in the long run. I think Baron Corbin is still definitely up there as one of the worst cash-ins yes, of all is, time. Because, sure. one, he lost a gender. <laughs> and two, it just it it was... It was dumb. It was a it was mess. Very dumb. Um, I just, I don't know. I feel like... I feel like maybe Theory will be there in like six to eight months. I also feel like he may just fall right or right back down the card because I don't maybe. feel like he he never did anything in NXT. But he was with Gargano and he was in the way. And but he didn't do anything when he was in the way. Well, no, he, he was just there. Yeah, but still, I just I'm he, not saying Triple H is going to push him to the moon like right, Vince. Right. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, I think. 
this is not a situation where Triple H woke up on Monday morning and said, well, Theory's losing the briefcase tonight. And They've been t- building to this. And then Tuesday morning, he yeah. woke up and said, oh, we shouldn't have done that. Let's get the briefcase. Yes, right. you're right. They're building to this. So I feel like as wrestling fans, we're not used to trusting the process. Right. We got to trust the process here. I agree. I completely agree. But to me, one of those things that should not, one of the things in wrestling that should not be wasted is the money in the bank. Sure. Because money in the bank was invented to, to push people through that glass ceiling. I agree. Yep. Edge, Punk, Rollins, um, Rollins. Um, Ambrose, Ambrose, Miz. I mean, Miz yep. holding Brian. that briefcase. Brian, um, RVD. Like yep. Rob Van Dam does not get a championship opportunity unless he, he has that briefcase. That. That's right. So, like, I I feel like it should absolutely elevate. And when it doesn't elevate, like a uh, Damian Sandow yep. or a Baron Corbin or an Austin Theory in this case, I feel like it's a massive waste of sure. something that should have gone to somebody else. I agree. Like. I'm going to die on the hill that Seth Rollins should have won that briefcase at Money in the Bank. Yep. Because Seth Rollins holding that briefcase, one, feels like a viable threat to Roman, and two, if he's still holding on to that thing, like, <laughs> we're, we are we are building to something amazing yep. as we continue on. So I just, I don't know. I feel like for Theory, I think Theory is going to be fine. Yep. But for the Money in the Bank briefcase sure. and for cash-ins, this was very, very... Very poorly done. For all the things that Triple H has done right so far, this was a step backwards. Yes. As of right now. Yes. We'll see how it goes. And I get, like, technically this wasn't... Technically this wasn't his fault. It was... The cash-in part was. Sure. But the fact that Theory had the briefcase in the first place was not his fault. Obviously, he could have found a way to get the briefcase off of him. Um, I I think when it comes to Triple H, because... Everybody that's listening to this knows how big of a Triple H fan I am. Sure. How much I love the fact that he's in charge of creative. I think one thing we are seeing is when he has control of two shows that are on a much larger scale than NXT, mm-hmm. not everything is going to work all the time. Sure. Absolutely. Like things are going to fall through. The, like the women's tag team championships have been iffy yeah. at times. Sure. I'm fine with the hot, I'm fine with the championship being a hot potato as long as it's not. Every championship being a hot potato. I'm fine with the women's tag team titles kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, I just, I we're starting to see that he is a genius because there are things that he's, everything with the bloodline is amazing. Yep. Everything with Bray Wyatt is amazing. Most of the stuff with Seth Rollins is amazing. Yep. Like we're, we're seeing a lot of really amazing stuff with him. There are going to be things that inherently just kind of, fall off to the side well and i think too that there's a situation where it's just like in life like you anytime you compare something that is okay or moderately good to something that's great it's it's automatically going to look bad no matter what it is right i mean we could we could sit here i went back and watched wrestlemania 38 sunday Mm -hmm. a couple days ago and like we could sit here and compare Johnny Knoxville and Sami Zayn to Roman and Brock right. or to let's say the night before Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes. Sure. From a wrestling standpoint in ring, one is much better than the other, yep. but as entertainment, like Johnny Knoxville and Sami Zayn, we were there in person. We both were dreading that match before it even started. And yep. at the end, we both looked at it and just said, that was fun. That was like, amazing. that was so much fun to just sit there and watch. You could argue that that was the match of the night and night number two. Um, probably. I think the tag match at the beginning was. Oh yeah, was, of course. Really but like, okay, fun. not match of the night, highlight of the night. Oh yeah, like when Wee Man came out and body slammed Sammy, that got one of the biggest pops of the wild. night. Wild, it was like, wild. It was, it was, it was, it was so much fun. Yep, it was a lot. Of so space. like, you have to look at wrestling things in context to yep. what they're built for. Yep. Our truth is not going to be a world champion. Why not? Why not? I'm fine with that. I'm <laughs> honestly, I'd be okay with it. But he's not. Oh, he's not going to beat Roman Reigns. No. But no. if he's in a segment with Roman Reigns, it's going to be hilarious, sure and I can is. take that in context with sure it. So like, it's just it's one of those things. Like again, Austin Theory in the long run is fine, but in the context of the Money in the Bank briefcase, this was a disappointment. Sure it was. I mean, you have the situation. I, I think this would have been different had Roman not have both titles. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You could have found another way for him to still lose the briefcase, but it not to be 
as drastic. Now, like yep. you said earlier, he could have cashed in on Roman, and Roman could have beat the snot out of him, yep. and it would have been fine. Or Brian Breaker. That was my next question. If Theory would have gone to NXT and cashed in on Breaker and lost, are you okay with that? Probably not. See, me either. Probably not. I think... I think if he cashed in on anybody in NXT, he should have won. Absolutely. Anybody on the main roster, he should have lost. I agree. But if he's going to lose, make it be for the world title, not for not for a mid-card title. I and, I just, and I just got done saying how Triple H has made the mid-card title feel bigger and special, and somebody, and again, ca- somebody cashing in for it makes it feel make, should make it feel Seth bigger. It's Seth Rollins. Right. But – that world title still means a lot more. Well, I think, I, right. But I think this is also twofold. This is something else we haven't talked about. You mentioned earlier Rollins on the on the verge of being a baby face. Right. I think we're at Seth Rollins' baby face. I think, oh, well, as close as we're going to get without Rollins coming out and, you know, hey, I'm a baby face now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because Bobby Lashley is clearly making a heel turn here. Yes. Even though he says, I'm not a baby face. I'm not a heel. I'm just getting what I want. Bobby Lash is a heel. Yeah. Okay. He yeah. is. Austin Theory, clearly a heel. Yeah. Both of them beat down Seth Rollins, who is a heel. Right. And Seth Rollins overcomes it. Yeah. We're in Seth Rollins' baby face territory now. So I say that to say this is guiding Theory down his story, but it's also used to elevate Rollins. I want everybody to hear what I'm about to say, not oh. read into it. Oh, Lord. Okay. I think there are two people right now that are in their rock bag, like being like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I'm not I'm not comparing them to the rock. Sure. I got you. Seth Rollins and MJF are going from being guys that run their mouth, talk a lot of trash, can be a heel personality, Mm -hmm. and the fans are gonna just gonna love them. Yep. Seth Rollins is one of those guys that when he I don't think the rock was ever truly a full fledged babyface. I agree with that. Because you don't get to from a wrestling perspective, a baby face is not going to be the one that <laughs> calls everybody what the rock calls right, everybody. Exactly. Like Stone Cold's not a pure baby face. Right. He he's he's the rattlesnake. He, right. you know. So I feel like we're in that territory with Seth and MJF where it's like when they become baby face, they're still gonna have their heel mentality at times. You can't change who the person is exactly and, and their character and their personality that much. Cody Rhodes is a pure baby face. Absolutely. There are pure baby faces yeah. out there. Cody Rhodes, Johnny Gargano, Ray Mysterio. Ray Mysterio is a pure baby face through and through. For sure. Um but there Sting. are Sting, but there are guys that are not yep. that are going to be baby faces. Kevin Owens. Like Kevin Owens is not a pure baby face. Right. But the fans love him because he says what he says. Like right. that like it's, it's just going to be one of those things. Right. Absolutely. All right. Whew. Let me address that. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's talk about Crown Jewel, man. What a show that it was. Um, I thought it was overall, man. I thought it was really good. Um, well, it could have been better, yeah, could have been much worse, though. Yes, we've seen um, much worse. We've seen <laughs> much worse, man. Let's talk about it. The main event, bro. I, as bad as I hate to say this, Logan Paul was so good, he was so good. I'm trying to think back to every Crown Jewel Saudi Arabia main event. I think this was the best crown jewel main event of all time. It, I would I would have to go back and look, but because, you're probably right. Because I mean, we've had some really bad ones. Sure, we have. We've had Goldberg Taker. We had the tag team match that we were not allowed to talk about on this podcast. Yes, that's correct. Um, <laughs> we've had Roman Brock that was not great. Um, their still cage match was not that great. Their singles match was okay. And you can't say. You can't really say Roman and Goldberg because they weren't the main event. Right. They kicked off the show. Right. What was the main event that year? Was that Fiend Seth? No. No, it was um or Drew. It was whoever was the other champion. Was it Drew? It might have been Drew. Cause I know like I know at the Rumble that year. It Drew, was Drew, Drew Goldberg. Goldberg. So it would have been Drew. Drew. It, was it Drew and I don't want to say no, not Big E. Drew and oh, it was the Elimination Chamber. Oh, duh. Where uh, Brock won. Brock won because okay. Bobby was champ going into that. That's right. Okay. 
That was the Elimination right? Chamber. So technically, yes, that was a Saudi show, but it was Elimination Chamber. So right. okay, I got you. But I think singles singles main events, this was the best and kind of by a long shot. Like well, as much credit as I want to give to Logan Paul and as athletic as he is and talented as he is. Number one, the dude was trained by Shawn Michaels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and you can see that in the way he wrestles. There's a caveat there. Caveat number two, he's in the ring with Roman Reigns, <laughs> who is literally doing the best work of anybody in the wrestling business right now. Maybe of all time, too. Maybe of all. Like, dude's on another level. He is. And if you can't be trained by Shawn Michaels and have a match with Roman Reigns and it's not good, bro, you got issues. And we said that going into it, like, N- not discrediting the Miz at all, right? But Logan Paul had a good match with the Miz, sure which is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to do. Sure, their WrestleMania match against the Mysterios was one of was Dominic fine. Mysterio's better matches. Like right. it was, it was a lot of fun. This match makes me want to see Logan Paul as a full time competitor sure. in wrestling. Like I well, feel I- like Logan Paul was meant to be a pro wrestler. I think that I. Pretty sure that it was Bully Ray on Bust that opened that said the exact same thing. He was like, there's a point now where Triple H needs to sit Logan Paul down and be like, look, bro. You've got what it takes. You you need to sign a contract. We need to do this. There are certain people that pick it up instantly. And he's Kurt Angle was one of them. Kurt Angle picked that picked up wrestling yep. like that. Brock Lesnar picked up wrestling kind of yep. like that. Logan Paul is one of those that, yep. I mean, the dude tore his ACL, MCL, and meniscus halfway through. He did not. There's no way. I I I think he got hurt, mm-hmm. but I there's no way that he tore all of that. Go back and what what spot was it that he said he did it? I don't the buckshot? I I think he said it was the buckshot. There's no way. Cuz he does a dive over the top rope after that. He does the frog splash off the top rope. He does the stuff on the table. Yeah. And there's no way. No way he tore his ACL, MCL and meniscus and did all there's there's no way. I'm, trying to... I'm not a doctor, mm-hmm. not an expert. There's no way that's true. No way. Probably not. I, I mean, I, he probably did tear something. He probably, he may have messed up his meniscus. He may have strained or sprained or something. Because I'm I'm pretty sure, I mean, there have been times, obviously there have been instances where somebody gets hurt and continues to wrestle. I, I feel sure. like recently somebody did tear all three and continued their match. But not not to that level. There's no way. There's, I just, the, I don't not. think there's any way he does the things he Unless does. Unless his adrenaline was that high. I mean, I his just, adrenaline, I mean, you could tell he was, he was sure he amped was. up. Oh, he certainly was. And I, again, I'm not doubting that he got hurt. He probably did get hurt. Right. Because that buckshot didn't look great. No, it looked better than punks, but. For sure. <laughs> it didn't look great. So I'm sure he got hurt. But there's, I don't think there's any way he tore his I mean, knee probably not. that bad. Probably not. But still, to, to be injured yes. and to do. Do the frog did. splash while holding a phone and literally hitting it perfectly on a table on a table from the ring is ridiculous. Yep, that was wild. Ridiculous. I love the fact that his podcast buddy's got the crap beat out of him too. Yep. I don't know if you saw the the, the podcast after no Crown Jewel. Um, both guys that are with him that came with him, both of them, one dude's in a wheelchair, the other dude's got a <laughs> neck brace on. And he said, one of them was like, You drug me to the Middle East. <laughs> to get my butt kicked, and you didn't even win. <laughs> and he was like, "Who who had to save us?" And he was like, "Jake Paul." He was like, "The only Paul to ever win a fight." <laughs> so like, they were going back. It was really funny. That's funny. Here's I'll say this too: if you think Jake Paul doesn't actually box, you saw his working punches. The dude actually boxes. Right. Like you, can, those those working punches were awful. Yes. But it was the most overbooked. Main event we've had in a long time. Yep. And it, and it was so much fun. And it worked. So much fun. I loved every second of this. Yep. I love the fact that there were a couple of times where I was like, Roman barely kicked out. Yep. And that and here's the thing, Roman didn't get a lot of offense in. Nope. Like Roman was on the defense most of the time. And I love that because he got something like right at the beginning. Right. That was really it. And then when Logan picked it up, like I love that because Roman hadn't been taking Logan Paul seriously. Right. The whole build up. And then at the end, you could see the look of relief on his face. It was like, I never want to see him again. Yeah. Like Roman played that very, very, very well. Great storytelling in the ring. And then commentary with Wade Barrett. Um, those two guys. Line. 
those two guys, oh my gosh, I thought, especially in the entrances, the way they were telling the story of this match, of how, you know, Michael Cole was saying, oh, Logan Paul, you know, went toe-to-toe with Floyd Mayweather, and Wade Barrett would come back with, yeah, but Floyd wasn't in his prime when that happened. We're talking about Roman Reigns in his prime. And then they're talking about what Roman's family used to do to outsiders in the wrestling business and talking about, the reason this match is different is because people inside the bloodline are doubting Roman. Yeah. Like just all of that kind of stuff was so good. And then when Logan, I think Logan Paul hit the, the frog splash in the ring mm-hmm. after the table spot and everything else. And Wade Barrett says, this is going to be the demise of wrestling purists or re- pure wrestling fans across the world. Yep. Perfect line because yep. it's true. Like this, if Logan Paul wins, this is WWE's David Arquette moment. Sure it is. Not as bad. Like no, not nearly. <laughs> Logan Paul's better than David Arquette in the ring. For sure. But still, like nobody wants to see Roman Reigns historic reign come to an end at the hands of Logan Paul. So sure. like that was the they they played this up. This actually felt like a big time main event. Sure did. So credit to WWE for production stuff, credit to commentary. Michael Cole was not great a couple years ago. He was good. He was not great. Right. Michael Cole has now entered possibly the greatest of all time commentary. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's obviously a- JR and JR in the attitude era is, is basically almost impossible to be at times. Well, that's because JR was allowed to be unfiltered. Exactly. On the and Michael, now Michael Cole is basically allowed to be unfiltered. And can be like, oh no, I'm actually a wrestling fan of just wrestling. Here's all this wrestling knowledge, and it comes through. Well, he dropped the Bullet Club on Crown Jewel. Yeah, and so we're talking about Bullet Club. We're talking about New Japan. We, you know, the we you talked about the relationship with New Japan and Carl Anderson being the never yep. open weight champion and all that kind of stuff. And, and Shinsuke is wrestling for Noah. Noah. So like, yep. they're, they're they're it's all there. Uh, but like I said, Cold Drop and Bullet Club. Judgment Day and OC six man tag. We both had, I think, picked the OC. I think it was right that the Judgment Day won this. Mm-hmm. But then we see on Raw on Monday the return of Mia Yim to even the odds. I love it. That was pretty cool. I love it. I think, I think Mia Yim fits the OC style, sure, perfectly. And obviously, like it's about if we were getting to the point where like, yeah, it's cool Rhea Ripley getting involved in stuff. We're getting to the point where like it, we. It's getting old. It's getting old. Somebody has to come in and do something. Yep. And so somebody like me and him coming in, I think was great. And then um, after all of that backstage, Bianca and Rhea going face to face. I guess. Yep. Please. <laughs> I need, I it's need coming. that match at the rumble. It is coming for sure. Um, let's talk about the other women from crown jewel. And of course, from Monday night raw, Bailey and Bianca in a last woman standings match. Last woman standing match. Very creative finish. Yep. Very nice match. Speaking of commentary, I can't stand the way that Wade Barrett <laughs> pronounces Bianca's name. Uh-huh. It's like Bianca. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> um, but you had that match, and then you had Eo Sky and Dakota Kai regaining the women's tag team titles. Man, was it just me? Was the crowd so bought into this tag match? They were very bought in. It was crazy. I I think, honestly, I think because of the Fiend stuff, the Saudi Arabia crowd loves Alexa. Alexa. I mean, when we haven't even talked about this yet, when she was cutting the promo before the match and the Bray Wyatt logo, the Bray Wyatt logo popped up on screen, the the crowd went crazy for it. Yes, they did. And she played that off perfectly as well. So, like, obviously they were invested in that. Yep. Um, and so I think that definitely played a, a massive, massive part in this. Cause I think uh, Alexa wrestled a couple times ago in Saudi Arabia, right? She did, the yep. first one obviously was Natalia and Lacey Evans. I don't remember who Alexa wrestled, but yes, she has. So, I mean, obviously they're, they're very, very familiar with her. Yep. Um, the crowd was a little dead, I think for the women's last man, last man last standing. One. Yep. Uh, last woman standing, whatever they call it. Um, how that that match was was a lot of fun. The golf cart spot. The oh golf cart gosh. spot was was. I was hoping. I don't know if they could do it. I was hoping that she would slam on the brake and Bailey would go off the off yep. the golf cart through the table, but that would have been way too 
that would have been way too risky to pull that off. Yeah, what if, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I, I think the crowd was hot for it. Nikki Cross getting involved. I love the fact that we don't know, like, is she a part of, I mean, she is, but she isn't, but she is. And it's, 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 a, it's a little wild for um, sure. But next time that you want to get rid of a title, make sure you actually throw it in the trash. Not, <laughs> not miss, not miss. Did you see her husband? You know who her husband is? Yeah. It's a uh, big Killing Dane. But yeah, Killing yeah. Dane, big name. He said, he retweeted the video. I said, well, she's never been good at basketball. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, no, of course, Nikki Cross winning the 24-7 title and then retiring it on Monday Night Raw. Perfect way to do it. Which is fine. No problem. Um, I think she's perfect for damage control. I yep. think she needs to be in there permanently. Um, but Monday Night Raw announced War Games. Here we go. Yep. It's going to be damage control, including Nikki Cross, and one other person, apparently, yep. against Becky. Not, not Becky. Bianca, Asha, Oscar, Alexa. Alexa, and two other people. Yeah, I think, I think the fifth person for damage control probably probably be Rhea. Either Rhea, yeah, and then the other like one of the four, one of the other two on the other side would be Mia, and okay. then Becky, Charlotte, Becky Lynch. Yeah, you know, she back by then. You think? Which Becky in a War Games match has to ha- like I think has to happen. I, I think I think she is absolutely back, and she is the fifth member of that team. Yeah, for and, sure. And then probably at the end is when we get Sasha back if she comes back. Sure. Oh, could you imagine if those other two are Becky and Sasha both? Yeah, I I don't know though. I feel like Mia has like if you if Rhea Ripley is in it, Mia Yim has to be in it. I don't think Rhea's gonna be in it. Charlotte, you think Charlotte's part of the damage control? Mm. Or Raquel? I mean, we mentioned Chelsea Green a couple weeks ago. That would be Chelsea would be great. Chelsea would be good. But I feel like if you're going to bring I, you Sasha know, back, you, you know have to bring I, Naomi back as well. You know who I think? We don't talk about NXT a whole lot on here. Zoe Stark turned on Nikita Lyons. Yeah. I think you could have Zoe pop in and do it. I think you could have Zoe. I think you could also have um, Core Jade. Mm-hmm. She can come in and do it. Um, Shotzi. She's babyface now, though, so she would yeah, be on the other side. Yes, that's true. I forgot she's babyface. Um, Shayna. Shayna. I mean, I know you're doing something with Rhonda, but you could put Shayna in there. I don't know. I think it's interesting. I think Rhea is a good fit, yeah. but I just don't know if that'll actually. Right. I don't know. Just depends because I really think we're going to have, and I don't know why it's not in War Games. I thought it was going to be Judgment Day and OC with Mia and Rhea. In War Games. In War Games together. Like right. I thought we were going to have that, but I guess probably not. Um, We can't go past this whole scenario without mentioning the yelling match between EO and Oscar. Amazing. So funny amazing such good stuff have you seen the translation for it no i mean no i read the translation but apparently there's a video there's a video with the translation translation. it's 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 great that's real funny um somebody else was talking about pro uh, try this again we're talking about pops in saudi arabia earlier with alexa bliss bro rock lesnar's pop saudi arabia always big was huge yeah oh my gosh they cheered him the whole match yeah it's crazy honestly this is probably my favorite Brock Lesnar match of this new run of his. Probably, yeah. Because sure. of the fact that he got beat up so much. Like he made he made even though he lost even though he won, which the finish is a little right, whatever. It is what it is. What um it is. he made Bobby feel like a big deal. Sure it did. Like nobody manhandles Brock Lesnar. Right. And Bobby Lashley did that. So like I'm I'm very that was great. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna get this at Survivor Series, the rematch, because obviously we're heading to a rematch. a rematch for sure. I don't know if it's gonna be at Survivor Series or if it's gonna be at the Rumble. Um, I would say the Rumble to keep Brock out of the Rumble match. I agree. Um, so probably at Rumble, he probably comes back at Survivor Series and attacks Bobby. Yeah, because maybe we're getting Bobby versus Seth versus Theory in a triple threat for the U.S. title. Be interesting. Yeah. And then at the end, Brock comes out and attacks Bobby. Attacks Bobby and Theory just for fun. Just for fun. Yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> uh, one more thing that I want to bring up from Crown Jewel 
is the Drew McIntyre and Karrion Cross steel cage match yep. much better than the last time these guys wrestled? Yeah, much better. Yeah, still not great. Maybe they just don't have good chemistry. I don't know. Maybe I hated the finish. To this, I hate. I I think the finish to this made Karrion and Scarlett look like absolute idiots. It did. You're right. And that did not, and not in like a good, like not in like a way to elevate Drew. I just think it made Karrion and Scarlett look like idiots. So that begs the question. A lot of people are floating this around online that Triple H has already given up on Karrion Cross. No, I don't, don't think, think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's one of those. He's gonna. He's trying to continue the story, right? And so Drew had to get the win, not convincingly, but Drew had to get the win. I think there are better ways to do it than what they did. Sure, without making. You know, Karrion and Scarlet look like he's Triple H is not going to bring well, Karrion Cross in like this and then just lose interest right. oh, five months later. Well, I also think, too, you have to think that if Drew, because you're not going to pin Karrion Cross, right? Drew's got to get out of the cage, right? If you don't have Scarlet somewhat distracted, she's proven that she's going to stop Drew, yeah. Uh, which so is you why have I, to find a way. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not taking up for what Triple H did because I think I thought it was weak too. Right. But I think you have to have some way to neutralize Scarlet for Drew to get out. Or you could just have Karen Cross throw Drew through the cage and then Drew technically hits the floor. Technically he wins, but he did not win because he got thrown That's through true. the cage. Like I think you could find a way to do it with something like that. That's true. Um, other two matches on Crown Jewel, Usos and the Brawling Brutes, really fun match. Yep. Braun Strowman and Omos. Better than we thought. <laughs> way better than we thought. The ring didn't collapse, so I'm sorry to all you people that I put that idea in your head and you did not get fulfilled. But of course, we cannot get out of here um, without talking about Bray Wyatt. Right. What a promo from Crown Jewel. And I noticed in the video package with Uncle Howdy. Yep. That they did not really hide Bray's voice as much nope. as they have in the past. Yep. It was very much Bray's voice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I think we I'm I think everybody at this point kind of knows that or thinks that we're heading to basically this is Bray versus Bray. Sure it is. Which in the past in wrestling has not always I mean Undertaker versus Undertaker was awful. <laughs> Kane versus Kane was awful. Right. So I feel like they're going to do something different with. I don't think I don't think we're actually going to get a match with Bray and Bray. Right. Um. So I don't know. I feel like I feel like if they do want to do something with Uncle Howdy in person, Bo Dallas more than likely will be the one playing right Uncle Howdy without actually being Uncle Howdy. Right. Um. So I think that that's one way to go. But not just the promo at Saudi Arabia. The promo on SmackDown before bro, Bray has never said truer words. That was so good, but he has never said truer words than saying than when he said, have you ever been cut off in traffic and you visualize if you had them for 30 seconds, what you would do yep. that was spoke to me. Cause I was like, I have been there multiple yep. times, Bray. I know exactly how you feel. I love that. Honestly, this is Jekyll and Hyde. Like, yes, it is. Bray Wyatt goes from being calm to instantly snapping and going crazy and going psychotic. So I I have not lost interest. I have like this has kept my interest. I am I am very excited. Honestly, I'm fine if Bray doesn't wrestle until WrestleMania. I don't think he will. I'm fine with these promos and him like I think he should get physical at some point and just oh, like, absolutely. I beat the too. crap out of somebody. I was so hoping he was gonna beat the crap out of that guy backstage. Yeah. That would have been so good. That would have been I think we're I think we're gonna build to Something he, he's like gonna that. hurt somebody. I don't know who maybe Ricochet. I could see him going after a Ricochet. I could sure. see him going maybe um Austin Theory. Austin Theory, Drew Gulak, like somebody like that. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna murder somebody. Somebody's gonna hurt for sure. But I yeah, I love the fact that we're just letting Bray be Bray. Like and I I think Bray is great in the ring. I think he's better in the ring than what people give him credit for. But what we love about Bray is his promos he's the best outside the ring he yeah yep. like his mind games his promos his creativity it's honestly he doesn't get enough we talk about some of the greatest promo guys of all time right we talk about stone cold we talk about the rock we talk yep. about cena we talk about punk we talk about randy orton to an extent mm -hmm. um honestly i think we could probably put mjf in that com conversation sure. as Especially for this generation, I think Bray Wyatt is up there as well. I think people remember his 
mumble promos that he did after his like his run has been really weird with like he was on fire when he when he came into the company when he came in as Bray Wyatt when he attacked Kane all that stuff yep. he was flying high the stuff with the shield was amazing mm-hmm. his stuff with Cena was really good and then after he lost to Cena it kind of came crashing down he started doing those mumble promos that were written for him things like that so I feel like we're starting to see the side of Bray that we've all wanted to see and so we care more about what he's saying versus necessarily what he's doing all the time yep I agree with that for sure. Uh, two things to mention real quick before we get out of here. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't do these two things. Number one, mention a Corey Graves line from Monday Night Raw. That was probably the commentary line of the week. Corey talking about Johnny Gargano's spidey underoos was so funny. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, it was amazing. It was yeah. so good. Uh, second thing. It wouldn't be an episode of the Pipe Bomb Wrestling Podcast if I didn't take another shot at AEW. The match to kick off Monday Night Raw, the six-man match, that is how you do a multi-man match and tell a story and not miss anything. That's all I'm saying. That match was incredible. Yeah. That was so good. Yeah. AEW, you need to take notes. That's all I'm saying. I think, that, I, think their, I think their mold works pretty well for them. I think. I mean, honestly, if... If we're looking at a pay per view and we see a six man tag on the pay per view for AW, we both go, "Oh, that's a train wreck. This is gonna be a lot of fun." <laughs> it is a train wreck, but like, I don't know that. But to me, like, that's how you make a multi man match entertaining, yeah, make sense, tell a story. Everybody's involved. Three segments to open the show. Yeah. Like, come on, yeah, it was great, very good. All right, man, that's gonna do it for this edition of the Pipe Bomb Wrestling Podcast. Hope you guys. Uh, or having a blast out there. Give us some feedback at PBW Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make sure you subscribe wherever you find the podcast and on the Body Sun Dot YouTube channel. And that you're tuned in to Sportswire Radio, sportnarium.com forward slash player every day. We up to All right, for Mr. Andy York, my name is Chris Buster. Thank you for hanging out with us. We will catch you guys. <laughs>